I'm not a prophet, but I know the voice of God and what God spoke to me. Call what you're about to hear, um, whatever you want, but I will speak what I know to be what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. It doesn't come from election results. It's not anything that has happened to us as a, as a church, but it is what I believe is what is coming to this country, what's coming to America. In fact, let me just say it like this, letters are coming, and I will explain that in just a few moments. I wanna speak about a wave of persecution that will come before God's final revival upon our nation. I want us to pray. Holy Spirit, would you just guide these next few moments? Would you speak to leaders and Christians all over the world? Would you begin to call those that are, that are not Christians into a relationship with you today? Father, I ask you more than any other time, Hebrews 12, would you shake the things that can be shaken and God, so the things that remain shall remain in these last days. May you help us, Holy Spirit, to hear your voice. Come and speak to the hearts of every person that is listening, every person that is maybe this has been shared with, wherever they are at, whatever church or denomination, whatever country, nation, or city they're from, Holy Spirit, come and speak to your people, speak to the church today, in Jesus' name, amen. I believe the COVID-19 and quarantine is a rehearsal for what is coming to the church. I think that the church doors being closed is the precursor for God teaching us really how to do church at home. And I think it would be irresponsible for us as pastors and leaders even in the church to simply try to get the doors open and not learn how to train the church today on how to have church with even out of church. I remember being in a car with David Wilkerson, the founder of Times Square Church, almost 30 years ago for three hours, and I asked Pastor David Wilkerson this question. When you preach prophetic messages around the world, it seems you speak from Old Testament scriptures. And I asked him why he does that. If those prophecies were just only specific for a group of people at that time, his answer made sense to me. David Wilkerson told me two things. He believes that many Old Testament prophecies were dual prophecies, that they had present and future fulfillment. And I believe that too. I think it is clear in scripture that there is present and future ramifications on many Old Testament prophecies. But the second thing he said to me is what began to resonate in my heart. David Wilkerson said, history is cyclical. Man's sin sins the same way over and over again throughout the centuries, which makes it cyclical. But let me put it another way. I wanna just add my rendition to what I think Brother Dave was even saying, that history is cyclical because sin is predictable. Let me say those words again. History becomes cyclical because sin is predictable. Sin doesn't offer anything new. It's the same old thing over and over again. That is why we can teach and preach from every book of the Bible because because history's main character is man, and man is a sinner, and therefore his actions are always predictable. That's why I believe when you read through the scriptures, G. Campbell Morgan, the great 20th century preacher from England, said it like this, nothing can happen today to which the truth of God has not, has not something to say. And I believe something is happening today, and I believe God has something to say to us as the people of God. Let me take you to one of those stories that I believe speaks to us today. We've got to cover a lot of ground in 2 Kings 18 and 19, so bear with me. There'll be a number of scriptures, but I think God is going to begin to make something very clear to us. Once again, this is not political. There may be somewhat of a prophetic edge to what I want to share with you. Here's the historical event of 2 Kings 18 and 19. Assyria has just conquered Israel. They have been used as God's discipline tool against Israel. In fact, Isaiah 10.5 says it. He says, woe to Assyria. And he calls Assyria the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. So God says, I'm gonna use this enemy nation to discipline my people. Here's the story of Israel's chastisement. It's 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 11. Then the king of Assyria carried away it carried Israel away into the exile to Assyria because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God. And this was all God's intention. But then something happens. Assyria becomes arrogant. Assyria decided if we won here, we're going to win everywhere. 
In fact, Assyria turns towards Judah to capture it like they did Israel. Let me read it to you, 2 Kings 18, 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. One of the greatest kings of the Old Testament, in fact, called a revival king, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is now in the crosshairs of Assyria because of the godly and the righteous man that he is. A.W. Tozer spoke these profound words. He says, to be right with God often meant to be in trouble with men. Grab hold of those words. To be right with God often meant to be in trouble with men. Here's a side note for just a moment. See, Assyria, when they turn towards Judah, is trying to play God. See, God's chastisement against Judah will come later, not through Assyria, but through Babylon for the same reason he judged Israel, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Jeremiah prophesies that. Listen to Jeremiah 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land. This That Babylon would be God's chastisement tool against Judah, just as Assyria was gonna be God's wrath against the children of Israel. Then Hezekiah, in this story, when Assyria turns and comes towards them, does something I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. I lean towards it not being the right thing to do, but he starts, Hezekiah starts to placate and parlay, in a sense, with the enemy, with Assyria. He tries to pay them off to keep them at bay so the enemy doesn't bother them. Listen to to what it says. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish saying, I've done wrong, withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So he's trying to negotiate with, with an enemy. So the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And it says this, Hezekiah, gave him all of the silver, which is found in the house of the Lord. He started to strip God's house to pay off the enemy and in the treasury of the king's house. And at that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord. Here's what it continues to say. And from the doorpost, which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Listen, listen to what G. Campbell Morgan continued to say He said these words. He says, the reason why men do not look to the church today is that she has destroyed her own influence by compromise. There are hours when the church must say no to those who would ask communion with her in the doing of her work upon the basis of compromise. That's what, what Hezekiah was doing was compromising with Assyria. Assyria's response is now that you've engaged in giving us money and paying us off, we got you. And so when, not the, when the money came to Assyria, Assyria now comes in with an army. That's what verse 17 says. Then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. Verse 19 then says, then Rabshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence that you have? Listen to verse 22. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? He's talking about idolatry places. And I said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, come make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. Then Assyria continues on, follow with me now, and begins to mock, get this now, they begin to mock God to the people of God. It starts going through verse 22. We just read it when when they begin to say that um, it's your saying we trust in the Lord our God, but he goes on to say in that in verse 25, listen to this. He says, have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? Verse 30, he says, don't let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord saying the Lord will surely deliver us. And then again in verse 32, he says, do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you saying the Lord will deliver us. People, listen carefully. Assyria just crossed the line. 
This is important to get. Assyria just crossed the line. They not only tried to play God by saying, if we judged Israel, now we're going to go ahead and judge um, Judah. They're trying to play God. And God goes, no, that's I'm putting Babylon there. They try to play God, but now they cross the line and now they are mocking God. The people to those mockings were given a command. And this is what the command was. Verse 36, the people were silent and answered him not a word for the king's command. That's Hezekiah was do not answer him. I wonder if Hezekiah regretted the money deal and realized we shouldn't have compromise with an enemy. We shouldn't have tried to keep them at bay by giving them by a little give and take. When the people wouldn't have conversation, and here's the part I want to talk to you about, that's when the letters started coming to Judah and to King Hezekiah. This is chapter 19. This is what I want to share with you about, that letters are coming. Letters are coming. Second Kings 19.14 says, then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers. This is what Assyria sent and read it. He went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And we have in the next verses, a little bit of the content of this letter. Listen to it in verse 10. Then you shall say to the Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely. So will you be spared? This is part of that letter. I'm giving a warning, and I believe this from the Holy Spirit. I'm giving a warning to every church and every Christian leader in the country. Listen, letters are coming. There are some enemies of the church of Jesus Christ that have won against the church in certain areas. And because they have won in certain areas, stay with me, they're going to try like Assyria to win in every area. Just as Assyria was used and won over Israel, they said, now we want Judah too. That's exactly what's about to happen. And just like Judah, I believe letters are on their way to churches in different parts of our country, from our preaching to our hiring and even to the people that we marry. I was Someone was visiting our church back in Detroit some years ago and didn't like some of the things that I said. And I didn't know the person that was sitting there that was the first time they sat there. And I began to speak on sin And I began to speak and call certain things sinful and certain lifestyles sinful. And literally, that was on a Sunday. On Monday morning, we got a letter to the church that someone hand-delivered that literally asked for a refund of their donation that they put in the offering. A refund to the donation. I... We, our office called and said, there are no refunds. We're not. And they stopped payment, which is absolutely fine. But I am telling you, that that was a letter that was just almost a precursor. And today, I want to speak to leaders. I want to speak to God's church. I want to speak to people that I want you to understand. I have a challenge. I have an admonishment. And I have even a warning that I want to share with you today. I have a challenge to the church that I want to share with you. I have an admonishment to the casual Christians. And I have a warning to the bullies of the church. I have a challenge to the church today. I have an admonishment to the casual Christians and a warning to the bullies of the church. Listen closely. A vaccine is coming to our country. Masks will eventually be taken off. I'm watching wood siding that was protecting all of our our New York City businesses is now coming down. As I walk the streets, they're pulling them all down and putting them all aside. That from the protests that they're going, we're at peace now. The racial unrest is gonna start to subside, but a new storm is coming to attack the church. When everything begins to go back to normal, I believe the church is going to become the target. Those that preach Jesus, those that stand for righteousness, I believe letters are coming. The devil doesn't persecute those who aren't making a godly difference in the world. And what is happening in this time, how God is using this pandemic and is opening up the borders through what's happening on the internet, it'll even start there. It'll start there by, by, by people in, in high places starting to come and even take the content that's put on social media platforms and start to begin to go after those. That's, that's why I believe the words of Leonard Ravenhill, a man that has had a, experience, a, a, a really important influence in my life, said, if a Christian is not having tribulation in the world, there's something wrong. And he went on to say, and I think he was right, if Jesus preached the same message ministers preach today, he probably wouldn't have been crucified. 
Wow, that's powerful words. I believe we're entering into an Assyrian age soon, but do not fear, but just to be aware. The government and the culture that we're in will just not push the church, but I believe it's gonna be Assyrian and bully the church. That Assyria and its leaders didn't just come after Judah, but bullied it until God began to show up. Until the right king, Hezekiah, would not be put in that position, but began to see God show up. The church is not being, it's not far from being in those crosshairs. Then in less than five years, if we don't comply with, with, for the, the, with, with demands that are coming, that I think the first persecution come was revoking everything from 501c3s all the way to doors being chained up, sermons getting monitored and for, being, for speaking against sin and being called hate crimes. What apologist Oz Guinness said is really true. Today, it's worse to judge evil than it is to do evil. Let me say those words again. Oz Guinness said, today, it's worse to judge evil than it is to do evil. And that's why, I don't know if it's God bless the United States, but God help the United States. I see this present virus lockdown as a preparation time for the church for a coming persecution in America against any moral stand that it takes. The church, I believe, is going to be displaced in the coming years and can go even like the first century into house groups and, and home groups. But I believe also that the church will be stronger than it has ever been and will be more distinct in its influence than it has ever been. That's why I want to speak to you these three things, a challenge to the church, an admonishment to the casual, and a warning to the bullies. I want you to bear with me because I feel like God is going to begin to speak something very clearly to us. First, I want to speak to you about a challenge, that it is time to pray. It is time to fall on our knees and pray. In the midst of the fight and the persecution, there will be raised up a praying church that will find its voice again, not through politics, not through a candidate, but on their knees with God. Charles Stanley, the Atlanta preacher, said it best that the shortest distance between a problem and a solution is the distance between our knees and the floor. I, I, I look all over and we're in a culture that is obsessed with our, with our phones. We're obsessed with holding them, taking them with us everywhere we go. There was a study that was done with cell phones to see how many times people actually touch their cell phones every single day. They said that the heaviest smartphone users will swipe, touch um, their phone 5,400 times a day, according to researchers. They said the lowest amount is usually about 2,600, between 2,600 and 5,400 on a daily basis averaging out the numbers to meaning that the heaviest users are touching our phone a couple of million times a year. And church, I just want to challenge you today that we need to have that kind of frequency talking to God. We need a church that knows how to speak to God and not necessarily speak on our phones. That's why it's true. He stands best who kneels most. He stands strongest who kneels first. And he stands longest who kneels lowest. See, bent knees, one man said, means strong backs that the most powerful position on earth is kneeling before the Lord of the universe. That's where God wants to bring the church because prayer is our acknowledgement that we need God. In this season, there is not a strategy, a program, a song, a denomination, pithy steps, but prayer is the only thing that's gonna take us through this. Or as Leonard Ravenhill said, a man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by men. And we have been too vocal, too long, in the wrong arena, God is going to teach us to raise our voices, not in rallies and marches and festivals, but on our knees at the throne of God. That's where 2 Kings 19 comes in. And Hezekiah gives us the example. First, it was verbal sparring in 2 Kings 18. They're, they're trying to pay off the, the infringing government of Assyria. Now they're sent letters. And now the children of Judah don't even know what to do. But the king of Judah knew exactly what to do. Leaders, churches, listen to me. Letters are in the mail and they're coming. That if you want to continue on to be nonprofit, government exempt, they're going to ask to compromise. They'll taunt, they'll challenge, they'll push and even bully. It's coming to accept things that are anti-biblical, but the church doesn't just need theology, but neology. That we will start to realize that the more we pray, the less we'll say. I think the church is so vocal today because we don't pray enough. And that's why this is, this is so important. 
And I believe that God is doing something. You let God do our talking for us. When Hezekiah told the people to be quiet, Hezekiah was getting ready to talk to God about the letters that he just received from Assyria. Listen to what he says in verse 14. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Here it comes. And he went up to the house of the Lord, spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, here's his prayer. O Lord, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Listen to this. You are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of this earth. You have made heaven and earth. Listen to what Isaiah then says. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel. Here, these words are so powerful. Here it is. Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. Listen, listen to those words. Because you have prayed to me about Assyria, Folks, if I can just keep saying that over and over again, because you have prayed, because you have prayed, because you have prayed to me about Assyria. Come on, just say it out loud with me. Because you have prayed, because you have prayed. See, God, God it's God calling his church back to their knees. It's God telling, telling us that the bullying of the church is coming, letters are coming, but a praying church is rising up. Leaders, I'm challenging you. Pastors, I'm challenging you. Deacons, elders, I'm challenging you. Call a prayer meeting. Call leaders to church. Ladies, call women to prayer. Start now. What happened when God's people prayed? What took place when all of a sudden they started, and they stopped paying off the government. They stopped dialoguing with them, but they started to become a praying church. What actually happened? You ready for this? Verse 35, then it happened that night. This is because they prayed that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. In fact, it goes on to say about the king. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home, lived at Nineveh. And it came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer killed him with the sword. What this was telling us is that God fought while his people slept. That while his people were at peace, God stood in, in the gap. See, every evening, one person said this, turn your worries over to God. He's gonna be up all night anyway. That's exactly what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah said, when I try to pay him off, it didn't work. When I try to dialogue with him, it didn't work. But when I prayed, God went into action. We will not be afraid because God is fighting for us. I wanna even encourage you, those that are listening, join us on Tuesday nights with Pastor Carter Conlin, our, our general overseer at Times Square Church, who leads a worldwide prayer meeting right here at Times Square Church. We're doing it at our Summit uh, Bible School, that you can join students from all over the world as Pastor Carter leads us in prayer to pray for requests that are coming in from, from, from dozens and dozens and dozens of nations from all over the world. And that God is gonna use prayer meetings, not just the to here at Times Square, but wherever they, they it happens. I'm watching it take place here from our elders praying. And that's why I tell you, pastors, get your church praying. We don't need to make deals. We don't need a, we don't need a parlay. We don't even need to conversate. Because you have prayed, let that be said of the church, because you have prayed, God goes into action. The second thing is really important to me. I want to give an admonishment that it's time to stand. Not only a challenge that it's time to pray, but an admonishment that it's time to stand. Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message Bible, said it is lowest time in the ministry, but his, his most popular time, lowest time in his life, but the most popular time in his ministry said these words, I realize my outside got bigger than my inside. Listen to those words. I realize the outside, the popularity got bigger than my inside. The church is getting bigger on the outside, but its people have not and need to grow. It's time to get the inside big and get serious with God. The days of a compromising church is over. The compromising church will no longer have a voice when the letters start coming. I was reading the story of what one man said in his biography. He says, my basic principle is that you don't make decisions because they're easy. You don't make them because they are cheap. You don't even make them because they're popular. You make decisions because they are right. I want to say something, and I want you to hear me out today. Be careful of people and preachers and churches who promote, preach, post, and popularize, listen to these words, 
the lawful instead of challenging people to the profitable. I want to say that because this is important. I want you to listen carefully. Be careful of leaders who promote, preach, post, and even popularize the lawful instead of challenging people to be to the profitable. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by any of them. Lawful things means that, that just because I can do them doesn't mean I should do them. Lawful things mean it. I can, but should I do that? We're watching this take place in the church. We're watching, we're watching what David Wilkerson prophesied decades ago. He called them sipping saints. Christians standing unashamedly with, with alcohol and, and even cursing coming out of leaders' mouths. Why is the lawful so dangerous? This is, this is important. Lawful never inspires holiness and purity. Lawful never distinguishes and differentiates you. Lawful is sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. And, and this, is what, this is why this is such a challenge for the casual today. We ask, is it sin, not does it please God? That's what lawful people do. We'll ask, is it sin, but not does it please God? One pastor said it like this, A.J. Gossip, you will not stroll into Christ-likeness with your hands in your pockets, shoving the door open with a careless shoulder. This is no hobby for one's leisure moments, taken up at intervals when we have nothing much to do and put down and forgotten when our life grows full and, in, and, in, and interesting. It takes all of one's strength, all of one's heart, all of one's mind, and all of one's soul given freely and recklessly without constraint. This is the challenge for the casual Christian. This is the challenge for the casual church today. Letters are coming and we need to get serious about the things of God. <laughs> I know in the midst of a message like this, it doesn't even seem appropriate, but, but I, I thought, man, this, this is powerful. Someone sent me a Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown, and Charlie Brown and Snoopy are sitting on a dock, and Charlie says to Snoopy, here's his theological moment. Snoopy, many folks are praying for God to heal our land, but I think he's still waiting for people to humble themselves, pray, and turn from their wicked ways. And Snoopy replies, amen, amen. We're saying God heal our land, but there is qualifications that even come with that, that God is challenging. He is challenging us, it's time to pray. He is admonishing us, it's time to stand. And let me close with this. He's also giving us a warning that it's time to wake up. I get it. The larger the platform to impact the world, the bigger the target is. I believe Times Square Church will be a target. I believe there are churches here that will take a stand that will be a target. Let me say this to every decision maker, wherever you're at, local, all the way up to federal. Listen to me close. To redefine what God says is to undermine his authority. To redefine is to undermine. To redefine what God has clearly said in his words is to undermine his authority. A word to our judges that are trying to even redefine the truths of God's word. You know, the Apostle Paul even said it like this in Ephesians 2.2. 2. He says, he tells the, 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 the church, he says, you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, telling you how to live. Wow. Paul got it. He was giving it to the Ephesian church. He said, you're letting the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. Only God knows how life really works. We've allowed others to tell us how to live and what to expect, but let us go back to the one who has given us life and created life. He's the source and he knows how it works best. And, and that's why that when God puts judges in positions, God's going, don't redefine. Don't redefine what I said to be true. God speaks to the judges of our land. Psalm 82 is a word from God directed even to judges from local all the way to federal. That, that, that think that they can make decisions that are rock solid. Keep this in mind. Your accountability is not just to voters and constituents, but our accountability is to God. And Psalm 82 is a reminder of that. God is sending a message to the, even to judges right here in our country. There's coming a day that the judges, 
Psalm 82 says, will be on the bench, but you, you will not be on the bench, but you'll be before the bench. Listen to what it says in Psalm 82. This is what this is God's, this is what David says. He says, All rise, for God now comes to judge as he convenes heaven's courtroom. He judges every judge and rules over every rule. Do you see those words? He judges every judge, rules over every ruler, saying these words, how long will you judges refuse to listen to the voice of true justice and continue to corrupt what is right by judging in favor of the wrong? Defend the defenseless, the fatherless and the forgotten, the disenfranchised and the destitute. Your duty is to deliver the poor and the powerless, liberate them from the grasp of the wicked, but you continue in darkness and ignorance, David goes on to say, while the foundations of society are shaken to the core. Didn't I commission you as a judge saying you are all, you are all, are all like God since you judge on my behalf and you are all like sons of the most high, my representatives. Nevertheless, in death, in death, you are nothing but mere men. You will be laid in the ground like any prince and you will die. He says, all rise, for God now takes his place as judge of all the earth. Don't you know that everything and everyone belongs to him? It couldn't be more clear that God sees every decision, every overturning of every law that is contrary to the heart of God, his responsibility. Let me give every enemy of the church and God's word the warning from a first century enemy who was a Pharisee and spoke these profound words in Acts chapter five. They have just locked up all 12 of the apostles in Acts chapter five. And the Pharisee Gamaliel spoke something very powerful as they were convening, convening the council of what to do with these apostles. And this teacher of the law ordered the men to be taken out of the room. And then he says to them, he comes up and he says, I want you to keep this in mind. He says, there's been a number of uprisings. He says, not long ago in verse 36, Theotis made something of a splash, claiming to be somebody, 400 followers. He was killed and his followers dispersed. He said, verse 37, a little later at the time, he says, Judas the Galilean appeared and acquired a following. He fizzled out. And then he says these words. So I'm telling you, hands off these men, let them alone. If this program or this work is merely human, it's gonna fall apart. But if it's of God, there's nothing you can do about it, and you better not be found fighting against God. Listen carefully. When you fight a work of God, then you fight against God. When you fight a work of God, and I, you fight God, and I have to tell you, the church is what God birthed. The church is God's work. The church belongs to God. Fight the church, and you fight God. Casual Christianity, casual pulpits, casual preaching will be sifted away. Recently, I was given a copy of a note found written in the office of a young pastor in Zimbabwe, Af in Africa, a few years ago, following his martyrdom for his faith in Jesus Christ. I'm gonna, you'll see it on the screen. I wanna read to you the letter that this man wrote to his church when he saw his death coming. This is what this martyr wrote before he died days later. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast, I've stepped over the line and the decision has been made, I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence and prosperity, position, promotions, plaudets, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, and even recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean in his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. 
I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, and I and, and until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. Give till I drop. Preach until all know and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Hallelujah. I want that to be my testimony. I want that to be the testimony of this place and this church. I want this to be what we give our lives for in these last days. I believe letters are coming, but I believe God is going to raise up a church. I believe God is going to begin to bring a last day's revival. I believe God is going to begin to pour out a spirit. I want to invite everyone listening to me right now into a relationship with the most exciting person in the universe that is worth committing all that we have to him. It's not an easy walk, but it's the most fulfilling. It's not a religion, but it is a day-to-day relationship with him, with the God of the universe. It's you making the decision today, today, right now, that you accept not just the challenge, and that challenge is it's time to begin to pray. Not only to accept the admonishment, it's time to stand. But for all those that have even been in an enemy, it's, it's time to understand, it's time to wake up. Because God is coming and he will win. And today, I want to be on the right side. I want you to be on the right side. Pastor Tim, what is that right side? That right side is being born again. That right right side is to have a relationship, not simply be connected with a church or a denomination. TSC, Times Square Church, can't get you to heaven. There's not a denomination that can get you there. There is nothing we can do from singing the right songs, being water baptized, taking communion, um, watching even this, 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 this sermon. None of this can get us there. It has to be a decision we make today, today, to give our lives to Jesus Christ. And Jesus calls that relationship being born again. That's the, that's the issue. It's the most important question anybody could ever ask you. Have you been born again? And I wanna ask you that today. Have you been born again? And today can be that day. Today can be the starting line that you come out of the block saying, that's the God I want to serve. That's the God I want in my life. Born again is not a Times Square church term. It's not a denominational term. It's not a church term. It is a Jesus term. Jesus said in John 3, 3 and John 3, 5, no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. That's what Jesus said. And then later on in verse 5 says, you must be born again. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? I, I, I can't make it any simpler and any clearer than saying it's as simple as we tell our children. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, admitting that I'm a sinner. That all of us, starting with me, have a condition called sin that's deep in our heart. And there's not a promise I can make to get rid of it, a program I can go through to, to eradicate it. There's not a priest that can get it out of me or a pastor that can, that can deliver me from it. We need help to fix it. I'm broken inside in the diagnosis of sin and I have to admit that I'm a sinner. Or as one preacher said this, he said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We are sinners in need of a savior. We need more than a second chance. We need a second birth. And that second birth starts with the second letter, the B word, which is believe. Believing that God sent his son to fix that sinful condition. I can't fix myself. I wish I could. If we could fix ourselves in God putting his son through the suffering that he did, will be the ultimate case of child abuse. If I can get myself to heaven by simply being good or going to church, then Jesus would never have to come and die on the cross. But Jesus' death for me was him taking my penalty, becoming my sin bearer. He died the death that I, that I should have died, lived a life I, didn't, I, I couldn't live, and gave me a reward, heaven and forgiveness, that I didn't deserve. But here's the commitment part. It's the C, confess. Confessing Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 talks about that. Jesus didn't come, suffer, and die on the cross simply to get us to sit in front of a TV screen and watch a sermon or to come to a church if your doors of a church is open. His goal was to not get you simply in church. His goal was to get you to heaven. 
to be with him forever. Coming to church simply on a Sunday, that's a religion. Being born again every day, that every day, that's a relationship. Christianity is coming to a person, not a place. And that person is now in charge. When you say you are Lord, you're saying you are boss. You're in charge. You have veto rights over anything. Over my casual Christianity, whether it's prayerlessness, you're in charge now. You own my calendar, you own my finances, you're in charge now. That's what it says, that's when you get serious with God. And that's called Lordship. And today, just as you had a first birth, Jesus says you need a second birth. And that can happen right now. Pastor Tim, what do you need me to do? I just want you to start by praying a prayer with me today. A born again prayer that says, God, I wanna start this relationship with you. I may not be perfect and have it all together, but I, today, I wanna be born again. I wanna start this relationship with you, God. If that's you, wherever you're at, you could be in your house, you could be on a couch, you could be in a kitchen, at a gym, you may be outside or even driving in a car. I want you to pray these words with me. I want you to pray them out loud. Maybe you say them together as a family, a husband and a wife say them together. Maybe a mom and a child say, let's do this together. Let's let, let's let Jesus be in charge of what we're getting ready to face and walk into. We can't do this without God. I'm so thankful, not only for what that Zimbabwe pastor said, but Hezekiah modeled. And I want all of us to live. And if you're here today, if you're listening today, and say, Pastor Tim, I wanna pray that prayer. Would you just pray this with me out loud? Dear Lord Jesus, come on, say the words with me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just pray that prayer, I want you to just to do one thing for me. If it's on a computer, on a, on a laptop, if it's on your phone, if you prayed this prayer, you made a decision, man, to say, I want that relationship with God. I want to be born again. Would you just text that word decided? You'll see it at the, at the bottom of the screen, D-E-C-I-D-E-D -E -D, to 88202. Decided, just text it to 88202 because you've made the most important decision of your life to be born again. We love you from Times Square Church. We're praying for you. Don't forget our worldwide prayer meeting. God bless you.